So let's take a little bit of a sidetrack because what I want to do now is talk about something, something that we haven't, some, another way to solve some of these diffusion problems. Uh, you, you've already done quite a bit in, in class and in your homework on, on um, solving diffusion problems using Laplace transforms. And that was a, a method that works. But as you've seen, that sometimes is very tedious and time consuming, takes a lot of intellectual effort to figure out how to exactly solve these things or set the problem up correctly. So there is an, not necessarily an easier way, but a way that's perhaps less mathematically sophisticated that works in many cases just as well as the Laplace transform. Less elegant, but um, elegance is not always the, the best uh, approach. And that's outlined in Appendix B. And so I'm going to talk about Appendix B for a minute. And what's Appendix B about? Appendix B is a chapter on called Digital Simulation. of electrochemical problems. The idea of uh, in a digital simulations, now Appendix B actually discusses one very simple way to do digital simulations. In fact, it's probably the simplest method and least mathematically involved and least amount of programming ability is required. Uh, as you go on, people want more efficient calculations. In other words, it takes less time to do the same calculation, it takes less computer memory, and so on. And so there's more sophisticated methods. We won't really talk about those. They're, they're available. You can look them up in the, in the book. But this will give you an introduction to the basic idea. Um, it used to be more critical, I think, than it is now when computers were expensive and computer time was expensive and, and computers were relatively slow. Uh, you wanted a very efficient algorithm to do the problem. Now, since computer time is very cheap, we can go back to more, you know, more or less, less efficient programs and still get good results. Um, you know, so what if it takes two seconds instead of a tenth of a second on a Pentium 2? It doesn't really matter. Um, before, it might take three days instead of, a, and instead of three months. So, so that's a big difference. But now it doesn't make so much difference. The idea of digital simulation, if I could write it, is to use a discretized model, discretized. In other words, take our equations and make the discrete forms of them. Uh, you remember the fundamental theorem of calculus is that we can take these infinitesimal quantities and use them to do calcula calculus uh, integration and, and derivatization. Well, before we get to infinitesimally small volumes and so on, we can get a good approximation to the calculus problems of integration and deriva deriva derivation by using discrete quantities, very small but not infinitesimally small quantities. The idea, for example, is if we want to model diffusion to a linear electrode or a planar electrode, I should say, we can consider the following geometry. We have an electrode surface. And I'll refer you to the notes. I'm probably got a little bit better drawing in the notes than I'll be here. But where we can think of the electrode surface as a collection of boxes with a certain volume in each box. And each box then has a certain width, which we can be called delta x in a certain area, call A. Now inside each box, we can think of the concentration of A is, is there. And we can call that box 0, the one right at the electrode surface. And then we can call other boxes away from the surface, uh, index them out, 1, 2, 3, and so on, all the way out to infinity or as far as we need to for the experiment to run. So what we've done is we've taken a solution that is, uh, in real life, is a continuous and infinite, and we've 
made it into a set of discrete boxes. What we can do is instead of using analytical expressions to model the flux of materials in and out of this plane of the electrode or part of the solution, we can take and think about uh, uh, parts of the concentrations moving in and out of different boxes. And uh, the idea is to set up in the way it does, it was doing it in the book, and this, this is, sometimes you can do it differently. Uh, it's to set the center of box, the, the electrode is at the center of the box, zero, or the one where we've notated CA zero. So in other words, the electrode would actually be located right through the center of CA zero. And X away from the electrode is just equal to J delta X. So X is in this direction. And we can use different sets of boxes for species J or species B, species C, and so on. So no matter what, we can do the same sort of box, uh, so on. Then we have to take and discretize the mass transport equations. Now those could be diffusion equations, they could be uh, migration equations, they could be convection equations. So we've taken, we have equations for diffusion, and so what we can do is make discrete versions of these. In other words, instead of a continuous function, let's make functions that are discrete. And so we can set up some model variables. In other words, these variables are the ones that we can change to make our model different. And for example, delta x, delta t, and we can make, say for example, our time in our real time would be k delta t. So delta t would be the increment of time, delta x would be the increment of uh, position. And just like we can make a continuous x, we can make a continuous t. And then there's usually a time, there's an index of some sort. So we're going to use k as an indexing part of time, and we'll see we'll use j as a um, index of space. So we would refer to a box as C sub a j in a general purpose of it. So let's take and discretize our equations. First of all, we'll look at Fick's first law. And remember, that's just the flux for any time and, and uh, position. Times the diffusion coefficient. dx. So just like in calculus, we can make these increments of x small. We can make delta x small. And so if we say jxt at the limit when delta x goes to zero is going to be equal to minus d times our concentration x plus delta x minus concentration at a place that's not an increment away. And then we would divide by delta t. So here, instead of a, a gradient function, here we've got just a difference. So we assume that the function is not is a, a linear function over that small delta x. And uh, as long as we made our delta x small, we can make most functions linear over a sufficiently small interval. As long as we don't have an asymptote or a discontinuity or singularity over that interval, we'll, we have good luck that way. So by using very small increments, we can assume the function is linear over that small increment. Uh, this would be delta x, yeah, right, sorry. Okay, so let's assume that we've done that. Let's make delta x small enough so that it works like we expect. So then we can write our discretized fixed first law as the following, minus d over delta x. And then for reasons we'll see later, we'll make our equation a little bit different Instead of C minus X plus delta X, we'll make X plus delta X over two. 
t and then minus x um, minus delta x over 2t. And you can see that's, a, that's the same as the other one above, but it, for reasons we'll see in a minute, it works a little bit better. All right, that's the first law. Second law. And um, rather than taking the second derivative of the concentration gradient, we can just take the derivative of the flux, which is this effectively the same. And uh, let's take the discrete version of that. We'll just put in for delta x and delta t, just like before. x minus delta x over 2t all over delta x. And we can substitute our previous flux equation that we've already got here into here. And I'll skip over the math. So here's, here's our equation for the, for the change in concentration at each time step. In other words, we're saying the at the concentration for any box that would be at the x distance at the time, at additional time step delta t. So we've taken, we know what it is at time step t. What is it at delta t plus that time? That would be this equation, where the original concentration, that's what we expect. We've got a box with the original amount of stuff in it, and then we're going to move some of that out of that box, and that would be a, uh, there would be a uh, sort of a, a fractional component here set by d delta t over delta x squared. And then we have the material that's in the box delta x plus, at a distance plus delta x, and then the material, subtracting the material at a distance um, delta x minus from that, and then we also subtract two times the material that's in the original box, and that just comes out of the equation. It's probably easiest to um, demonstrate, and I'll show you on a, a set of boxes. And this would be out in solution somewhere. So maybe we start out with 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, and then 0, 0, 0. This would not be normally what we'd see in electrochemistry, but for our purposes, we can think about that. So this would be at time t. And then another set of boxes we can think about as, as existing at t plus delta t. So here's our discrete time interval. So in that interval, we've got a box x, x plus delta x here, and x minus delta x here. And if we apply these formulas, let's, uh, let's make an assumption about that term here. Let's assume it's 0.4. Um, see, we can just plug those in, and that would be 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 plus 0 0.4. Oops. Um, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5
minus 2 times 0.4 plus 0.2. And if you do that math, you see that here would be 0.38. And if you do, so that would be the new value. And if you sort of move along, and actually if you do the whole thing, you see that it's a 0 0.08, 0 0.24, 0 point, whoops, 0 0.24, 0 0.08. Can't draw today. So if we only consider that little bit of solution, you can see now the concentration has spread from the higher concentrations to the lower concentration boxes. So some has moved into the lower concentration boxes and that will spread, continue to spread out. So if we kept doing this time incrementation, we would see that concentration eventually spread to fill an infinite number of boxes extending out either in either direction. So our model, so this little variable here, this little collection of terms here is actually an important set of collection of terms. We call that our model diffusion coefficient. And it refers to how rapidly that material spreads out. You can see that if we make that collection of terms larger than 0.4, we're going to get more material moving in and out of those boxes at each time step. And if we make it smaller, less materials moving in and out of each time step. So our model diffusion coefficient, d sub m, is uh, one we're going to really be interested in uh, using in our model because that captures all the values of delta x, delta t, and d in one set of var in one variable. So in fact, rather than doing experiments where we change delta x, delta t, delta d every time, we actually have one dimensionalist parameter that we can adjust and we can make one set of curves based on d sub m being some particular value. And then because all these values are interlinked, we, have, we can break those out if we wanted to get the real numbers later. And so we're going to use d sub m as a dimensionless parameter that allows us to, to do that. So that's a dimensionless diffusion coefficient. We also need a time parameter. How much is delta t moving in each time? Well, we know that it's linked to the model diffusion coefficient. How do we get delta t back to the sort of the real world? Well, what we'll use is a, a t sub k, or t sub k is what we're going to call our characteristic time. And t sub k can be really any value, but we want to choose some value that's representative of the actual experiment. Now, for a potential, a potential step experiment, it would be a good choice to make t sub k equal to the length of the potential step. So that would be a characteristic time for our experiment. And so usually that's what we'll do, but not always. So, and usually then we divide t sub k by L, which is um, how many how fine we're going to chop up our characteristic step, uh, characteristic time. So how many pieces of time are we going to be interested in? And that might be a hundred, it might be a thousand. The finer we chop time up into little increments, the more closely we can monitor things that are occurring at higher speeds, but the longer it's going to take to do our experiment because we have to model every step of time along the way. And um, we can also think of time divided by our characteristic time as equal to k over l. Again, remember k is our, is our index into the time. So k being 0 would be time equal to 0, and k equal to l would be the end of our experiment. So t sub k. Maybe it would be the end of our experiment. What other thing do we have to worry about? We have to worry about distance, and we have delta x there as our distance parameter. And uh, again, delta t and delta x are linked. We can't arbitrarily adjust delta t without at the same time adjusting delta x uh, to fit our model diffusion coefficient. 
So we're choosing D sub m and everything else has to fit whatever we've chosen D sub m to be. Delta x is our real variable's diffusion coefficient and characteristic time divided by our model variable's diffusion, model diffusion coefficient and the L value. So if we make D sub m very large, that means that we're going to have small delta x increments. And uh, it turns out that for our linear problem, linear diffusion problem, D sub m has to be less than 0 0.5 for stability reasons. And the reason for that is that, let's take a look back at our little collection of boxes. If we make D sub m greater than 0.5, it turns out that more material can escape than actually is present in the original box to begin with. And that's not what we want to have happen. What will happen then is the model will not converge to a solution. In fact, it will start to diverge and it will oscillate. And we can see that. And that's pretty simple. You can think about these problems and if we put in 0.5, it doesn't really make much difference with 0.5, but if we put in 0.6, rapidly we'll get numbers that will not make sense physically. D sub m might have to be a different value for different situations. Now, since D sub m is limited to be less than 0.5, that puts some limits on what we can have for delta x and delta t. We can't make delta x really tiny without also making delta t uh, somewhat large. Okay. Then finally we have a, um, a parameter that we can think about as dimensionless distance. Dim, dimless distance. And we'll use the chi as our dimensionless distance. In other words, this chi would be the box, the distance in terms of boxes. And that would be J over square root of dm times L. All right. So now we've got a, a set of model uh, di dimensionless parameters. Again, why are we using dimensionless parameters? Because that makes it much easier to do the calculations. If we didn't use a single parameter, we'd have to make calculations for every value of delta t and delta x to get to capture the experiment properly. But once we've made one calculation using our um, dimensionless numbers, we don't have to redo it for every a different value, as long as we understand they're linked together. All right. So now we've got diffusion outside in the solution. And that's the equations that we've got are very good for that. They'll ad accurately model diffusion to just about any level of accuracy that you want. There's some tricky parts, though, that comes up. First of all, we have to think about, since we're not talking about just diffusion here, we're talking about electrochemistry. We're talking about reactions at the interface. So we have to put in an interface someplace and have the diffusion occurring up to that interface and also having electrochemistry happening at that interface. And what we really want usually out of our experiment or our simulation is the current. And that current would be versus time or versus potential. So what do we need to get our current? Well, we need to know what the flux is to the first box. Essentially, whatever's coming into that first box is going to give us some indication of what the current is at that first box. So the flux and again, K is our time index, so K plus 1 would be delta t plus, or t plus delta t is essentially what we're talking about. So the flux into that first box, box zero, from box one is what we're interested in. We're not, we're not going to consider the flux from box two and three because we've only allowed the system to have 
concentration changes from box to box, not from two boxes away or three boxes away. Okay. That's going to be our diffusion coefficient times concentration. And we'll use a notation F sub A to indicate the fraction of the concentration that's in each box. So F sub A would be equal to the concentration of whatever's in the, that particular box, concentration divided by the bulk concentration. So it would be some number from 0 to 1. So outside the electrode interface, it can be any particular value and so on. But to get the flux, to get the current out of the flux, what we need to do is now apply our boundary conditions because uh, there will be no net flux into that first box unless we have some sort of boundary condition at, that's going to apply at some point. There'll be some flux initially as diffusion starts, but it'll equilibrate and then we won't see any changes into that first box. But if we have a boundary condition, we can start having some current flow. So what kind of boundary conditions can we have? Well, we can have any kind of boundary conditions we had before. One example would be the Cottrell boundary condition which says the concentration of species O at the box, at box zero, or at x equal to zero at any time is equal to zero. Again, that's the Cottrell uh, condition. If we make that as our boundary condition, and we will do that for now because it's an easy one, what would be the current? Well, the current would be everything we'd normally have in the current for that, but it would be whatever's in box two minus box zero. Box zero is zero because of the boundary condition, so we can leave it out. And dividing by our box step. And again, that's assuming FA zero K is equal to zero. And that's the Cottrell condition. Other, condi other kinds of boundary conditions do not, would not have this particular form or the current. This particular boundary condition does. And so then we can convert our current into the dimensionless form because since we're having dimensionless time, space, and so on, we're going to have a dimensionless current as well that will take out any effect of concentrations and so on. So current in dimensional form, we use the uh, Z as the current. At any particular time, plus one, equals that collection and if you do the math you'll see that that just equals to our model diffusion coefficient dm and l to the one half power and the amount of material that's in the second box or box one. I want to point out that in my notation here is different slightly than the notation in the back of the book. The book uses box the first box next to the electrode is box one, and I'm using box zero. I think box zero is easier to, the math is simpler actually when you don't have to think about the first box being box one. Uh, but so you'll, you'll see that if you follow along. It's basically the same as the book except for that difference in the notation. Now, where is that current coming from? Remember that current is coming from a net conversion of all the material coming into the first box and then being electrolyzed. So A is going to B uh, to make the concentration of A equal to zero in that first box. So everything that's A that's coming in is getting turned over to B, if that's what's happening, A plus electron to B. And so that's, that's what we're seeing. So that's the current that we're observing. When is that current actually flowing? Well, it could be flowing when delta T 
the fir at the first point or part of delta t, or it could be flowing at the end of delta t. But since we've made our box, the electrode right in the center of the first box, it actually makes more sense to have the current being effectively flowing at the midpoint of that time increment. It doesn't make any difference in our model, but later when we want to interpret the model results, we want to know when that time is. Uh, and so we'll make that time that the current actually flows during that potential step increment as being the midpoint of that time increment, and that would be that. K minus 0.5 over L. K again is the integer, so is J, so is L. These are all integer quantities. <clears throat> it turns out that we want to be a efficient when possible. So it turn, we want to know, for example, if we're doing diffusion away from electrode surface, we don't want to consider every box out to infinity. We only want to consider the boxes that are uh, important. And those are the boxes are the ones that are, the concentration changes actually occurred in. So if we, if we have an idea how far diffusion will actually occur for a given number of time steps, we can stop our number of boxes at that point and not consider any further out. Anything further out would be infinity for the purposes of our model. So we can actually calculate that. That's J max uh, is equal to approximately six times our model diffusion coefficient times the number of time steps so far. So K can be as high as L, but uh, if K is two, we only have to consider a, a very small number of boxes. And so that J max comes about because it turns out that in normal space for a diffusional process, we only see a change in concentration from about six times dt, the, the product dt to the one-half power. In other words, only a factor of six times that square root product is the concentration changed. So that's where this relationship comes in. Now, we've also, we've, so far we've only considered one species, but as I said, one we're talking about, let's say, a potential step, we're converting A to B, and maybe we're considering converting A back to B, and maybe we can think about other species being present in our simulation, so uh, we want to consider all of those, and we need a, a diffusion coefficients for all of those. They're not necessarily going to be the same. So, if we say d sub m is equal to d sub m sub a, that's the diffusion coefficient of a ultimately, then d m b is going to be um, d m a over d b over d a. In other words, whatever the ratio of the actual diffusion coefficients of b to a is, we would set the b value to be that ratio. Now again, the maximum value of d sub m is uh, less than 0.5. So if b is, has a faster diffusion coefficient, we have to take d m a down to make sure that b does not, the d m b value isn't larger than 0.5. All right. So we've talked pretty rapidly through these equations. And they're not really difficult, but they, you do have to sort of look at them a little bit to make sure you understand what's going on. Uh, so let's take a look at an actual calculation and see how we do this. It turns out that the book has a simulation that's written in Fortran, but I was looking at it yesterday and I thought, well, I bet we could do that on a spreadsheet. So I wrote a program in a spreadsheet to do this calculation, and I'll show you it on the computer screen. I think it'll be easier for you guys to to play with because you don't need a Fortran compiler, you just need Excel to, to run the spreadsheet. So let's do that. And uh, the simulation is uh, on the computer pods.xls. Now I didn't bother to make it into Lotus. It might work under a Lotus version, but um, I don't see why not. But it, it turns out that uh, it worked under Excel, so I'm assuming that it'll only work under Excel properly. Uh, so if you want to play with it, convert it to a different form of spreadsheet, you can go ahead. And we're going to do a potential step in this experiment. 
and we're going to set t sub k equal to tau. Again, tau is our time for the potential step. And we're not assuming any reverse step. We're just assuming that's how long our potential step is. Okay. So let's take a look at it. I'm not sure how fast this runs under um, can't see where our office is. <laughs> now these are this was on the on the web page, so you guys can go ahead and download it from the web page. It's a little big, so if you have an old or slower computer, you might have a little bit of trouble with it. But, and I'm a little bit worried about this computer, exactly. Now, here's our calculation, and you can see I've got some information about here. We're going to have L equal to 200. In other words, we've cut up our time into 200 pieces. We have our model diffusion coefficient of 0.45, and it'll make our B for now 0.45. So that means J max will extend out about 60 times and 60 concentration cells in the solution. Since we've got a spreadsheet, we've got a natural interface for this particular problem. We can use each cell in our spreadsheet as a concentration uh, of box. And unlike the calculation in the book, we don't have to throw away the array of data. So each time step we can save in our spreadsheet. So as we go down the spreadsheet, we go here to here to here and so on, those will be new time steps for the simulation. So here would be, for example, k would be zero. That would be the time zero in our experiment. And remember, in the Cottrell case, time zero, the concentration is equal to the bulk. And then we have time one, time two, down to 200. And along this axis, we're going to have the J values. And this would be the distance away from the electrode. And you can see this extends all the way out to about 61. Now, if you went to larger values of L, you'd have to extend that out a little farther uh, and so on. But then at this point, we're assuming that's infinity. So we just put in a constant value of 1. But inside each of these boxes, I don't know if you can read it. You probably can't. But it says this box is, says BL20, which means that's the box. BL20 is the box just above it. And that's BL21 is equal to DMA times BK20, which is this box, minus 2 times this box plus uh, BM20, which is this box. Now here we're way out in solution, so we don't really see any effect. Uh, the other thing I should point out is that this was a, uh, uh, initially was a uh, uh, instead of having the spreadsheet recalculate automatically, which would actually take a lot of time, I have it set so it recalculates uh, when I push a button, F9 is the typical button for a spreadsheet recalculation. So it's a manual recalculation, and that's what you want to set it to. Uh, and so when I hit F9, it'll recalculate. I'm not going to have it do that. But if you play around with the numbers and copy and paste, you'll have to hit F9 to change it. Um, but then let's take, a, let's take a look here right at uh, time one. The concentration initially is one all throughout. That's the bulk. And then after that initial time step, we get 0.5. And then it decreases as well. Now, the, in the first box, we've set the concentration equal to 0 because that's what it's going to be when the electrochemistry occurs. Now, on the other hand, if we look over on sheet B of the spreadsheet, this is the concentration of species B. and it's now equal to 1 in that first box because all the 
A that was there was electrolyzed, and it was originally one, is electrolyzed now to, to, um, to, um, to B. And since A, since A is always zero, it turns out B is always zero as well. So here's the concentration gradient of species B, and this would be as we uh, increase the K value. And I'll get, this would be very, it's exactly the same as you get when we did this analytically, if we did the same analytical calculation as before. But now we're actually mod modeling it in, in a different way um, with the simulation. If we go back, we can actually look at a couple things. First of all, we can actually compare our calculated value to the Cottrell equation. Since we're doing a simulation that has a solution, we can compare exactly. And we can see here we can plot those two. And let me see if I can show it all on the same screen. I'm only showing the first 100 points, but you can see it's pretty close. But you might see right at the first few points, it's not quite exact correspondence. And if we look at the uh, a plot where we plot the uh, current versus uh, t to the minus 1 half, remember that should be a, a straight line with a slope. Uh, same thing happens here. And you can see that here, which is actually at very short times, you can see the divergence quite clearly. And you can see it kind of oscillates here, but then eventually it gets a pretty good agreement. And further, a little further down, you see the uh, percent error that's involved in the calculation. You can see that if we go look at the first 20 iterations, we do see a quite a large amount of error, but then it decays to less than 1% after that. So initially, our calculation at short times is not as stable as we like, but it's, it's, it's not too bad. And if we change DMA to be smaller, we'd have a little less error as we go uh, along. If we change A too small, though, we would not be able to get a, uh, an accurate calculation, or DMA too small. Here's the concentration profiles of A, as we'd expect. At short times, it's uh, this way. Uh, there's B. Again, we can plot, actually, A and B together. Stupid thing. And what you see here is that result. Um, this would be the, the B values. These would be the A values. And you can see at short times, you can see the concentration gradients are quite steep. And at long times, they're less steep. Let's just, let's just play around a little bit. Let's make a DMA and DMB equal to 5.02. Now, if I hit F9, I'll calculate the spreadsheet. And look, look at, here we see the curve. It doesn't look too bad, but if we look at the, the air, it's worse. You can see now there's this, kind of this oscillating result there. And the concentration profiles actually start to see some some oscillations, particularly at long times. And that's because we've allowed a long time for that propagation to occur. Let's make it a little bit more, and we'll see even more dramatically what happens. Let's make it 5.05. Um, there we go. And now you can see the oscillation even at shorter times. And if you went to um, there's the error. And if you went to 0.6, the error would be off scale. You couldn't even get a good result. So, uh, but it turns out if you go to slower DMAs, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, uh, you get a pretty good result with the error. In fact, the curve fits better here. The error is much less. You can see it's it's less than one over almost the whole range, very much less than one out to after 20, and so on. Concentration probably all the same. Now that's that's okay, but um, it turns out that 0.45 is really a better one to use because it's not always possible to predict exactly what kind of 
calculations you're going to have. And essentially, since the error is still less than 1% over most of the calculation, that's good enough. We don't really, it doesn't have to be exact uh, to eight decimal places to still have usable calculations. I've also put in a, uh, and I haven't shown you all the calculations. You probably want to take a look at this and you can play around and look at the calculations of how we did that. Compare the appendix B to this value and you'll see a, um, you'll see the uh, effect. Let's quickly look at, uh, a, vari a variant of this one where we did, I put in the reverse potential step where it steps out and then it steps back. Uh, here's our calculation and simulation and you can see it's a uh, pretty good fit as you'd expect. There's the air. When you do that reverse step, the air increases again. The reason for that is that you've got a really large discontinuity and, and this, uh, you go from zero to one and that sort of sets up a, a poor convergence. It doesn't converge very well. After a while, it does tend to converge because the gradient is quite steep and we're trying to do stuff over, very sh uh, over a large section of, um, a large section of concentration or a large uh, distance in concentration compared to where the concentration change is occurring. In other words, concentration is occurring over a very short section and our delta x is actually larger than that. So until that gradient sort of relaxes to be the size of our delta x and so on, we get not as good results. But again, it does converge as long as our uh, DMA and DMA are less than 0.45, we get convergence. Here's our concentration profiles um, for species A. Uh, as you'd expect, as we go, there's a shorter time. Here's a little bit longer time here. Then as we step back, remember we're going back to converting. Instead of A being used up, we're actually chewing up B back to A. And so we get a re re relaxation. And there's that bubble of, um, of um, concentration that's away from the electrode surface. And there's B. And if you look at those together, you can see they're essentially mirror images of each other. That's what you expect. Uh, because the diffusion coefficients are the same, we, we should get mirror images of those concentrations. Notice here, B and A have the same shape, just sort of reflected uh, there and so on. That holds as long as uh, DMA and DMB are the same. Let's make DMB shorter or smaller. Uh, now notice our uh, uh, calculation is not correct. That's because our calculation assumes the, the, the equal diffusion coefficients. Uh, I probably should change that, but that's, uh, that shows dramatically. The error is a little bit more too because, again, because we don't have the right, cal uh, right uh, equation. Species B concentration looks a little different. It's easiest to see here. Now that you don't see that mirror image behavior, uh, B tends to be piling up next to the electrode surface because it's moving slower. It's not diffusing as rapidly. So, uh, and so A is extending out, but B now has this hump at a closer distance, and that's the effect of that shorter diff diffusion co coefficient. Okay. I think now would be a good time to stop for our break, and uh, we'll continue this in a little bit.